All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining today. Um, welcome to this third installment in the Web3 and Society series. Um, today, we're going to be discussing plurality and digital democracy with Glenn Weil, who is the founder and research lead of Microsoft's Decentralized Social Technology Collaboratory, founder of Radical Exchange, and also founder and chair of the Plurality Institute. Um, we were very lucky to chat with Glenn last July uh, at the Interintellect, and we're really excited to have you back. Thank you so much for joining. Um, Thank you for having me. Yeah, so Wes and I have been hosting these discussions on technology, society, and progress over the past year. Our goal is to have thoughtful, educational, and multidisciplinary conversations with guests and attendees from different backgrounds. So not just technologists or those deeply embedded in the space. And we're, we're going to continue on that theme today. And since we have a smallish group, we can start with introductions. So just name where you're based and what brings you here. Um, and Wes, I'll let you introduce yourself first and then just popcorn it. I am Wes Chow. Um, I'm, I'm a, a research engineer at the uh, Center for Constructive Communication at MIT um, and affiliated with a nonprofit, uh, Cortico, that's a part of the lab as well. Um, and I'm in the Boston area. Um, so I'll popcorn to Tobin. Sure. G'day, everyone. I'm Tobin. I'm a PhD student in the MIT Media Lab, um, normally from Boston, but I found myself in my favorite place in New York, which is the New York Public Library. Excited to hear the chats today. Um, I'm going to pass it on to uh, Aziz. Hey, uh, I'm Aziz Galani. Uh, I'm a, a venture capitalist. I live in Houston, Texas. I also teach at Rice, um, uh, uh, and I just I, I I do a lot of advisory work, kind of on the side. Um, uh, I'm always looking forward to meeting smarter people than me. So this will be a lot of fun today. Um, uh, uh, I'll pass it over to uh, my fellow Trekkie, Nathaniel. Hey, everybody. I'm Nathaniel. I am a health services researcher in DC. Um, I am joining this because I remember hearing uh, about some of these ideas a long time ago on Econ Talk and uh, have been interested ever since. Uh, so, and then I'll go to, let's see, uh, Nomad, please. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Vince. I'm the founder of Nomad, which is a creator collective. Um, it's part of my, uh, mission to basically bring collective intelligence into existence in this world. And that's part of what brings me to the table today. And I am based here in Boston, Massachusetts. And let's see, I will popcorn to Kelly. Hi, I'm Kelly. I'm based in Princeton, New Jersey. And I'm here because Alaka is one of my best friends from college. And she was telling me about this talk and I thought it sounded really interesting. Popcorn too. Um, Koelty. Apologize if I said that wrong. No, you were brave enough to try, so thank you. Um, hi folks, I'm Colty. Um, I'm a poet and artist and general weird person uh, based out of what is presently known as Chicago, Illinois in the United States. Um, I'm here um, because I have much more of a, a philosophical and ethical understanding of Web3 than I do of, I would say, a technological or engineering one. Um, but a lot of my communities and companions have me curious about what Web3 means to them. So I'm very excited to be here listening, learning, and interintellecting with you all. Um, to that end, I'd love to hear from Lauren. Hi, everyone. I'm Lauren Rosavi. Um, I am executive director of a project called Plumia based in a company called Safety Wing. And we are basically building a country on the internet for digital nomads. So this concept of exit that we're gonna be discussing today uh, is super, super relevant to kind of what I do with my time. I also wrote a book called Global Natives, uh, kind of on global mobility, the kind of past, um, present and potential of borderless work. So again, a kind of a link in there. 
Um, I am a full-time nomad at the moment, but I spend a lot of time in Amsterdam every year. So I kind of consider that my home base. I'm calling in from uh, my parents' house uh, in rural UK uh, today, though. Um, and yeah, very, very happy to be here. Really looking forward to this because it's my first inter intellect uh, salon. So aside from one that I actually spoke in, uh, but very, very excited. Uh, and I will popcorn to Anna because she looks so enthusiastic. I don't make things. It's my first day out of illness, so I'm so I'm like, oh my god, I'm not wearing seven blankets. Winning, winning this. Um, so so great to be here. Glenn has been one of my uh, great inspirations in how interns are actually structured, and you know we've learned so much uh, from you throughout the years, and this is kind of a dream come true that this is your second intern tech so I'm like what what is the lottery that I won here this is amazing I, I was too short the last time though I was there for like half an hour so now we're doing the full time so. now we're like cancel your day you're here <laughs> order lunch <laughs> we'll keep you here um I, I'm just it's so exciting to have you know to see this series develop um with an interns act uh John, Jonathan Hill is here uh was one of our partners in crime in conceptualizing the whole thing and and I think there is a deeper <clears throat> there's a deeper lesson here of having a trend that everybody seems to know everything about, like Web three was in the past one year or so, um, but without the deep understanding of how that actually fits into the wider web of of how society works, how our institutions work, and how 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 much we actually understand its deeper impacts. Um, and so this is why we made this series with an interintellect um to explore these less obvious um uses and to have an og like glenn here um i think uh, i think uh, we're looking into a very very exciting day or evening regarding uh, depending on where you are um john should we popcorn to you since anna mentioned you and you're our first guest Awesome. Hello, everyone. Um, John Hillis. Uh, I'm the founder of Cabin. We are building a network city. Um, I usually live uh, at Cabin's neighborhood zero outside of Austin, Texas, um, but I'm currently calling uh, from a boat in Austria um, with a satellite internet connection. So my apologies uh, if I if I drop or lose the connection or have to go off a video. Right. Uh, That's yeah. the best food in the world. You have to eat all the food. I have been eating all the food. It's been eat, great. Or uh, eat from me and send me photos, um, okay? Because it's like... Yeah. I just ate this delicious uh, like sausage wrapped in some sort of breaded product. It was really good. Anyway, um... I mean, I'm, I'm, I, this is like fully non-kosher because it's basically like sausages filled with cheeses. But I'm going to like send you extensive details after this salon. Okay? Wonderful. I will find it. Um, awesome. And yeah, I'm a big, big fan of uh, radical markets and have thought about how we can use um you know, harbinger taxes and some some of the the and we we use quadratic funding already, quadratic voting um, at Cabin. So, um, big fan of of a lot of the ideas from uh, from that book. Um, and I will popcorn it over to JD. Hi, sorry I joined late, but I kind of get the drift of what people are touching on. So, uh, I personally love learning, and I work in innovation, and so part of it is just being exposed to new ideas. And I feel like I could just attend intellect salons and my job would be done. Uh, there's so much cool stuff going on in this community. But uh, yeah, Web3, I'm kind of new to it and um, uh, definitely trying to learn more and kind of uh, borrow other people's mental models to have a model in my head of what's going on. So excited for today's salon and thanks for organizing and thanks for putting it together. Um, I'll, I'll popcorn. I don't know who went before because I, I'm sorry I joined a little late. Um, I, I think Alex and Nancy are the two remaining, right? Yeah, I can go. Hi, everyone. My name's Nancy. Um, my interest sort of echoes a lot of people who went before me. I also am a digital nomad, but also I work in marketing. And we've been talking uh, about like innovation and what other uh, partnerships and products. And I think Web3 is really interesting, although I think for now it's mostly like a philosophical interest. Um, but yeah, I just want to be better informed so I can learn like what my role could be like and um, how I could use Web3 to sort of leverage into the kind of life and future I would also want. And I'll pop over it to Alex, you said, or Aziz? Alex. 
Hi, I'm Alex. I'm based in San Francisco. Um, I'm technologist by background. Two things happened in March of 2020 that changed the course of my thinking. One was I read Radical Markets um, and was like, oh, this is interesting. There should be more thinking like this in the world. And the second is that um, I joined a group of volunteers to help with governments with COVID and have kept doing that since as part of a group called US Digital Response. And so my interest here is really the bridging of the the old world or the current sort of power structures and, and thinking um, and with this like newer world and new ways of thinking. Uh, a lot of our work is really helping the nuts and bolts of government delivering services to people. And I'll pop on it to Alaka. Yeah, so um, I already uh, went a little a little earlier, um, but yeah, I'm based in Austin, Texas. I'm a data scientist and Wes and I have been holding these conversations over the last year or so in technology, society, um, and progress. And just to kick things off today, um, well, since since we have like a pretty intimate group, like please just chime in with questions and comments. We have questions for Glenn. We we want to hear about his work and his thoughts on this topic. But everyone is like welcome because um, to chime in, share their experiences, um, and talk because we want this to be a conversation and not not a talk uh, in the traditional sense of the world. So, um, Glenn, in February you wrote why I am a pluralist. So tell us about what is plurality? Um, why is this an important topic for you and how has it evolved as an area of focus? So plurality is trying to be an alternative frame for the future of technology to what we, we being me and Audrey, see as two dominant narratives about the future of technology. So in fact, I have a piece uh, that is called Political Ideologies for the 21st Century that I think came out around the same time or maybe slightly earlier that kind of frames uh, the context around it. And um, so the, the idea is that uh, the two standard frames we hear are either the AI story, where like machines are going to get super powerful, they're going to replace human intelligence, um, or like crypto is going to get super powerful and human institutions, human collective organization is going to like crumble um, because like there's going to be no ability for institutions to sort of monitor or check on people. And um, so like institutions will be replaced with code. Um, and what we want to, uh, the story we want to try to tell instead is that there's a direction for technology that's about connecting um, people and institutions more powerfully to one another, empowering them to collaborate better and sort of proliferating that complexity and uh, cooperation across that complexity. So like, that's the basic idea of plurality. It's like, it, it's meant to sound halfway between a technology and uh, political philosophy. And in fact, in traditional Mandarin that they use in Taipei, um, uh, plural and digital are actually the same characters. And so they, uh, like it, it's, it's a literal double meaning there. And we did our best to replicate that in English with the term plurality. And of course we can dive much more into what we mean uh, by this, but anyways, that's just like the ba the basic idea is it's a it's a broad vision for the future of information technology and society, like AI or crypto, but with a different focus than either of those trajectories. And you recently started on a book project with Audrey on this front, right? Yeah. So the book project is aiming to tell to a reasonably broad audience, maybe somewhat broader than the audience of radical markets, but sort of similar to that, um, what morality is and why it's, you know, critical for the, for if democracy is to have a technological future, why plurality is the right direction to invest in. So kind of, kind of going on that vein, um, Tell us a little bit about like how we might implement a more pluralistic society, um, whether 
there have been things that have been implemented in Taiwan for anyone who's curious or things that you're also seeing unfold in the United States? Yeah, so um, of course, we can go into a huge amount of depth about like all the different elements of the tech stack that I'd like to see and so forth. But I think it's best to just start with a sense of like what this might mean. And I think, you know, real world examples are always the most persuasive. Taiwan has done incredible things with technology to facilitate um, the proliferation of and cooperation across social differences. Uh, one of the most famous systems like this is uh, in the U.S. called Polis, in Taiwan called B-Taiwan. This is a participatory democracy platform that's similar to Twitter in format, but um, rather than highlighting things based on engagement, it organizes things based on the divergences across people. What are the clusters of opinion and what are the areas of agreement across those divergences? So it helps surface areas of diversity and pluralism and areas of consensus across difference and to allow those to inform uh, the structure of policy making or collective choice, et cetera. So um, that's like one nice illustration of a plural technology, harnessing the same types of tools, you know, statistical analysis, et cetera, that underlie quote AI unquote, but using it as a way to um, understand and say back to people the structure of social interactions rather than uh, technology uh, itself or, or replacing human interactions. There's a, um, uh, recently in the last, uh, I think year or so, Twitter has started experimenting with the, uh, with the Birdwatch project, which has drawn some, you know, for, for spaces, some, some elements of, of polis. Can you talk a bit about that? And, um, uh, and if you have any insights into, um, well, Wes, you probably know the details of it better than I do, frankly. So maybe you should hold forth on that one. But, um, as I understand it, Birdwatch is a fact-checking service um, from Twitter that um, rather than using expert fact-checkers, uses the patterns of uh, sociality on Twitter and agreement across those patterns to surface what it views to be a fact. Um, and then uh, highlights those uh, and highlights the patterns of sort of across those differences, responses to uh, concerns about a particular claim to uh, determine whether that claim might be uh, spurious. Wes, do you want to speak to it anymore? Yeah, I, I, I think um, uh, I think it started off like they, they were positioning as a um, it, maybe as a fact checking thing. But it's um, I think the instances that I've seen of it now have really been more about providing context around what might be an ambiguous or, or disputed claim. Um, but there is some, uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how it works, but there is some kind of an element in there where, where they, um, uh, they are looking for, um, for things that are, um, bridging, right. Or, right. Or, or, you know, perhaps, uh, need some sort of a context across a wider kind of a diversity of, of clusters of people. Um, but it is, uh, you, you know, I, when, when it, when it started, um, when it launched about a year ago, I think, um, it was kind of a, a uh, a darling project, I think, of the trust and safety community, and then now it's actually a thing that uh, I think that Elon Musk is is uh, I think he's very into it and behind it um, you know, as a way to kind of deal let, with. Let, let's see how long Twitter lasts after the stuff in the last. Year. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, yeah, so so I think um, uh, it, it might be uh, nice to transition a little bit to um, quadratic voting, which which actually for for me was uh, really my entrance, I think, into um, a, a lot of the the uh, plurality thinking. Uh, this is probably similar for for a lot of people. Something that's that's like very distinctive, I think, about the um, the the plurality <laughs> philosophy is that it has a kind of a, a mathematical formalism that is like very appealing um that i i haven't really found i guess in other political philosophies so can you talk a bit about quadratic voting like how you uh how you came to it like how how it informs like the rest of the philosophy um let me give you how i think about it now and then we can return to the history behind it because my perspective on it has changed quite a bit recently and i think there's like more compelling ways to describe it than i uh, have been describing it in the past so there's a few different like fundamental principles 
that are central to um, like the contemporary political order. One is what you might call Westphalianism. This is like the sovereignty of countries and sort of the countries should treat each other as equals or something like that. Um, a second one is democracy. And a third one is um, uh, capitalism. So capitalism is based on the principle of like units of value, each all being equal to one another. Democracy is based on the principle of people all being equal to each other. And, uh, and Westphalianism is focused on the notion of countries being equal to one another. Now, um, those all have been very influential and they all play an important role in modern life, but it's kind of pretty obvious that these are not particularly consistent one with the other. And that like anytime you don't have like absolute clarity about which principle should apply, which is going to be in a lot of cases, they're going to come into conflict and tension with each other. So like different countries have different numbers of people uh, in a union or in an international organization. Should they all get equal representation? Um, different countries have different amounts of money again um uh, in in a you know democracy different people have different financial resources so how do you reconcile capitalism and democracy so these are these are all like big challenges and um what i want to suggest is like maybe coming back to west's point like one reason why we're stuck here is because equality is like the simplest conceivable mathematical relationship that one can have, you know? And like, maybe we need to go just slightly beyond that if we want to capture a little bit more of this complexity. And so what I would suggest is that like a natural first extension is if you want to take a couple of different principles of neutrality that are in tension with each other, a natural way to do it is to in some sense split the difference between them. And what does it mean to split the difference? Well, one way might be to split the geometric difference between them. So like, if we want to kind of be neutral across countries and kind of be neutral across people, maybe countries should be represented um, by the square root of the population that they have. Maybe that should be like, that's how many representatives that they should have. Or if you want to be neutral across money and neutral across people, maybe you should like something related to the square root of the stake that you own should give you your representation. So uh, I think actually that's the simplest way to think and actually the most general way to think about what's going on with quadratic voting. And quadratic voting is one application of this principle. It's kind of the one where you take the square root of stake to get the, um, to get the votes. And uh, there's a principle called degressive proportionality um, that's from the 1940s from a legendary statistician and eugenicist, uh, uh, Lionel Penrose, who proposed um, that idea and be it became part of effectively the European Union's rules for the allocation of uh, influence. So um, there's lots of different ways to justify this principle. I've now learned that it has about like seven different rigorous derivations from completely different sort of formal systems. But one of those is um, statistics. So if you have a bunch of independent random variables and you add them up, they grow as the uh, square root of the number of random variables rather than linearly, because on average, they cancel each other out. And so all that's left is that square root, which is kind of like the average amount by which it go ends up, even though they cancel out on average, going in one direction or the other. Um, and uh, correlated variables grow as linearly in the number of observations. And uh, so uh, if you want voice to be um, heard equally, both the uncorrelated and correlated voices, you need to take any correlated voices and square root them. And uh, basically that's what quadratic voting does. If you're sort of thinking like, well, we've got a bunch of dollars, but they're being correlated by like a central actor who's trying to control them. So you like square root them. 
And the same thing happens across, you know, within countries, across numbers of people. Um, happy to talk about applications of quadratic voting if that's the direction you want to take the conversation. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be helpful. Yep. Yeah, so quadratic voting is used all over the place these days, actually. It's uh, quite common. Um, it is used in um, the most popular strategy game of all time, something called Civilization VI. I don't know if anyone's ever played that. It is used in... Um, uh, it's used in... Uh, the Colorado State Legislature by both parties to decide on the budget allocation that they want to request. It's used in Taiwan to decide the winners of the presidential hackathon. Um, it's used in the city of Nashville to allocate actually on 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 votes on substantial votes, not budget votes, but like other votes for the city council. Uh, and it's used in innumerable other places, tons in the blockchain in, in a variety of ways. So happy to go into any of those. But uh, yeah, another variation on quadratic voting is something called quadratic funding, and that is used uh, especially in the blockchain space. What's the presidential hackathon in Taiwan? The presidential hackathon in Taiwan is um, something where uh, groups from across the country form these data coalitions that propose alternative government services and they get voted up and then they receive an award from the president that encourages the relevant government agency to work with them on implementing the idea. And how, how's the reception around that been? And, and generally like has quadratic voting been successful? Have people found it easy to participate in? And do we see increasing applications or has it not really, has it just been like specific locales that have adopted it and a lot of other people aren't as interested? To my knowledge, essentially every example of quadratic voting thus far has spawned like, you know, greater than one uh, examples going forward. So like, I think it's growing. How fast it's growing and how fast these things can spread is a little bit complicated, but um, but it does seem to be pretty well received so far. <laughs> Do you, do you know if there have been any instances, like like any kind of analysis, like showing that, um, like under quadratic voting, this was a set of particular outcomes, but if there was a counterfactual of like you know one person one vote or something, right, that would have been the uh, the sort of outcomes. Um, I, I like for large scale elections, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a little hard to know because you, like quadratic voting is intensity information that you don't elicit um otherwise right and so mm -hmm. however in the book radical markets we we have a footnote where we took a liquor this is just standard like strongly agree strongly disagree and if you take that as if it was an incentive compatible elicitation like quadratic voting does which it's obviously not um then uh so then you can get a conclusion about this and the conclusion was that John Kasich would have been elected president in 2016. But again, that, that's like, this is not a very good apples for apples comparison because um, like no one was eliciting that information with that idea in mind. So it's, it's kind of hard to know exactly what would happen. But yeah, I mean, I, I I don't I don't know how credibly even in the absolute best case one could do the exercise that you're you know describing, um, yeah that that's basically the problem. Mm -hmm. Um, Alex, would you like to ask your question? Uh, sure. I was just curious. I, I live in California. We have like enormous numbers of ballot propositions, and sometimes I wish I could allocate my votes, you know, <laughs> more on one than on another. And I'm curious if anyone's like sort of explored quadratic voting in the context of those kinds of situations with like large numbers of ballot propositions. I get that there are ballot design issues where somebody could game the system, but it seems like it might also be a way to like elicit strength of preference in an interesting way there. Um, Great question. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what we talk about in radical markets. It's exactly that application. So um, definitely an application close to my heart. I'm also a Californian, 
Um, and uh, yeah, we have a whole discussion in the book about gay marriage and blah, blah, blah. But yes, that's exactly, that's definitely one we've been thinking about. I think that's probably like the first application that most people heard about was the idea of using it for a variety of uh, binary referenda. It's a very simple, direct uh, application. Uh, John, can you uh, tell us a bit about QV with Cabin? Yes, I had to move to a more public place uh, so the internet would keep working. So it's, anyway, sorry, bear with me. Um, but uh, yeah, so Cabin is structured as a DAO. Uh, and, you know, like, like um, I guess many DAOs now, uh, increasingly so, we use quadratic voting. Um, yeah, the big challenge with that, of course, is civil resistance, which is um let which basically just means verifying um individuals so that people can't game the system by getting much extra votes um and we uh don't have huge concerns with that because um there are only about 500 token holders right now um so it's it's not you know sort of at the scale of the problems that like Bitcoin, for instance faces with quadratic funding um but what it does is it just allows us i'm I'm, uh, you know, as the founder, one of the largest token holders, um, and so by using quadratic voting, um, you know, folks like me uh, sort of get less of a say than we would if we were just using a one one token one vote mechanism, um, and we we can you know get a better read of uh, how all of the participants in the DAO feel about um, you know issues that we're voting on. I'll drop some links. That uh, was very snap, elegant, snapshot. eloquently explained. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Glenn, Glenn, can you explain the civil problem and um, and maybe if you have from some insight into how um, uh, various uh, QV setups are dealing with it? Yeah. So civil problem is when you pretend to be multiple people, and obviously in quadratic voting, because it's quadratic, if you're able to pretend to be multiple people, you can get a lot more votes than if you uh, are just one person, because the whole idea is that you pay the square of, uh, of the number of votes or you the square root of your stake is how much votes you get. So um, because that function is concave, uh, it's meant deliberately to sort of compromise be between the principle of like one person, one vote and, you know, one one unit of value, one vote. Um, it is going to be uh, corrupted if you can just pretend to be lots of people, just like any voting system that cares about human beings and numbers of human beings will be corrupted by such a system. So, um, I, you know, uh, the, the general approach, um, to dealing with the simple problem has been very literal in the web three space. People have been trying to like do basically like proof of humanity, Turing test, blah, 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 to be like, are you, a different human being. But I don't think that actually really gets at the issue because almost all organizations that are involved, that are using this technique are tiny relative to the whole world. So if the only thing that you're doing is checking that someone is a unique human being, it actually really doesn't reduce the cost of an effective civil attack very much. Because like if there are 500 people participating in something, but any unique human being is allowed to participate, then you can just go and recruit um, a bunch of people who aren't already participating, uh, which will be 99.99999% of the world. So like, if you're like a right-wing troll and you're trying to spoil a, you know, QV thing, like there's a lot of other people who'd be like happy to like for 50 cents, sign up for an account and they're another unique human being. So I think the reality is like the civil framing of the problem is an extremely thin and sort of socially uninformed understanding of like the actual issue here. The actual issue is not a civil problem. The actual issue is that we care about social context, belonging, and social identity in making decisions together. And like those are the things that we want to be, you know, running an analysis over. And those are not tracked by purely financial systems like standard blockchains. Like that's a much, in my view, better way of understanding the issue. So you're, yeah, you're, um, 
uh, you're you're hinting here at, at a decentralized society, right? Like another um, uh, set of ideas that you've been developing with Pooja Oliver and uh, uh, and Vitalik Buterin. I'd like to come to that, but actually there there, there are a couple other things that I think might be interesting to cover. Um, yeah. With with QV, like one of the um, uh, you know I think um, kind of cool and amazing things about it is that you've um, you you and your collaborators have like discovered sort of uh, links between QV and other areas um, like uh, um, like in philosophy the Kantian categorical imperative and then uh, I think um, you just collaborated on a paper recently uh, linking it somehow to quantum mechanics. So can you can you talk about some of these other linkages? Yeah. So I said as I said this. Principle can be derived in a lot of different ways. One way to derive it is the Kant has this idea of the categorical imperative, which says that people should act as if um, they're, you know, by their action, everyone else would act in the same way. And so you can think of that as a solution to the public goods problem. The public goods problem is one where people are hesitant to com contribute to some common good because they have to pay the cost and everybody gets the benefit. If they could compel everyone else to like make a contribution as well, they would be happy to do that, but they can't. And so they get locked into this dilemma, right? Um, and so the categorical imperative, uh, like how could we make that into a rule if selfish people were uh, participating in the system? But what you'd wanna do is you'd wanna match their contributions. You'd wanna sort of tax everybody and match the contributions as an inverse of that person's fraction of the total thing. So if there's a hundred people, um, you want to imagine that everybody else contributed like you did. So like if you contribute a bit more, you want a hundred times that amount to go to the thing because you're only one one hundredth the value. Now, the problem is like, what does it really mean that everyone acts the same as you? Well, in a condition conditions of heterogeneity of diversity, everyone acting, you know, the way that you do is is a little bit complicated. And and the natural way to interpret it is to say, if you are one one thousandth of the value, you should get a one one thousand for one match. If you're one one millionth of the value, you should get a one million for one match. And it turns out that if you write down the differential equation that corresponds to that that is exactly uh, uniquely solved by the quadratic funding rule. Um, and that was actually proven recently by this guy, uh, Mike Friedman, who's a fields medalist and one of the leading mathematicians on quantum uh, computing. And after that, he also made this other link that Wes is describing, which is it turns out that there's this rule for quantum decoherence um, that uh, takes the contributions of, you know, different possible paths, th these that constitute the wave function, and uh, then com compose those together and turn them into something that determines the probability of seeing a particle in a given place. And that uh, rule is um, actually, in some sense, equivalent to the rule in quadratic voting, according to this analysis by uh, Mike Friedman. So that draws a connection between quantum physics. The way, the way I, he thinks about it is that, you know, how should we interpret what's going on in quantum mechanics? One way to think about it is that there are these different desires for how the world might be, these different aspirations for how the world might be. And we can think of uh these different aspirations all participating in a in a public good which is how does the world end up appearing to a given observer and so you can think of them solving that problem using some sort of a collective goods mechanism and quadratic funding is is an optimal one and so that's a natural potential solution that the world, you know, that the universe could have stumbled on. I have um, a comment and, and a question. Uh, so someone was a asking for more details about what I was talking about earlier. I dropped some links in the chat, um, including uh, Kevin's snapshot, which shows where, how, exactly how we use um, quadratic voting. Um, and you, you can see all the votes. Um, what one, one comment I'll add is that, and I think this maybe speaks to the, um, uh, California proposition question earlier. Um, what we found is that 
you know, quadratic voting is great for binary decisions. It, I think, is even better for multi-choice decisions. And what we found is that the best way to sort of understand community preferences so that we can act on them um, is to do uh, quadratic multi-choice voting, where we're, we're sort of like creating a stack rank of, of um, you know, a, a set of options using a quadratic mechanism. Um, and then, you know, particularly if you can frame a question, not just as a yes, no question, but as a set of options, um, that's a particularly good way to gather more detailed information um, about the options. Um, and uh, I, I uh, also have a, a question, um, which we can save for later if there's more to talk about with quadratic voting. Um, it's about uh, harbinger taxes, which is also another related area from radical exchange that, that I would love to get to at some point. But just to say one thing to follow up on what you, what you just highlighted is I definitely have gotten the strongest positive feedback about quadratic voting in exactly the context you're describing, because it creates a way of prioritizing things where almost everyone leaves feeling like they really had their voices heard, even if they didn't get their most preferred option. So that's been a really important feature of what I've heard as good feedback about quadratic voting. Yeah, I think we found that governance is, um, you know, and I think Vitalik uh, has written some about this as well, like the legitimacy of it is the most important part. And um, like, it's a very good way of having the community feel like it was a legitimate process. Um, so I, I, I'd like to uh, change topics, but before we do that, uh, so John, if you have your question about Harberger taxes and then uh, uh, also mix, I don't know if you wanted to comment on your experience with QV at all, or if anyone else has any any last QV questions. Uh, John, why don't you uh, go with your Harberger? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, basically, you know, I think our Harberger taxes are a pretty interesting idea. Um, I'm sure Glenn can like explain them more concisely than I can. Um, and, and so I'll let him do that. But uh, you know, they're um a, a mechanism for basically thinking about like um often in the context of like real estate, you know, who who gets to live where. Um at Cabin, we're thinking, you know, we're we're building a new city, and so we're very interested in um new models of land allocation. Um, because we think a lot of the existing problems of cities ultimately boil down to, um, you know, NIMBYs and, and that boils down to, uh, land ownership. Um, and so, uh, it seems like a really great solution to that problem, but practically speaking, um, you know, it, it sort of relies on this mechanism where at any point, anyone can kind of like kick you out of your house, um, and so there's there's like I think some practical implementation issues with it. And so Glenn, I'm I'm interested um, if you've heard or seen any sort of modifications of um, of something like a harbinger tax, but that doesn't rely on um, you know that like solves some of the more practical issues of of people not having to like you know get kicked out of their house if if someone else uh, is willing to pay pay more for it. Well, okay, so. I think there's like issues that you might call practical issues, but then there's there's issues that are more fundamental. Like I think the notion of someone else kicking you out of your house is fundamental to the Harbor Tax thing. It's not it's not just a practical implementation issue. It's the whole idea. Um, the whole idea is that the property does not belong to you in any absolute sense. It belongs to the community. So if you don't have something that that means. Uh, it it mean, it's meaningless. It's just like the whole mechanism makes no sense, you know? So, um, however, I think there's both like some practical ways to soften that, but more fundamentally, there's the, the, the idea is limited and needs further elaboration, I think. So in terms of just softening it, I mean, you can give periods of waiting, you know, before the person has to leave. That's how eviction works. I mean, this, this sort of thing does happen all the time, right? Like if people can't pay their mortgage, if people can't, like people do get kicked out of their house, they don't get kicked out today. So I actually think, you know, in terms of just like making it practical, like 
we we have a lot of experience making the notion that like just because you are physically in a place right now does not mean that you own it making that concept practical and dealing with the issues around it but like to the extent that you just are fundamentally not comfortable with the concept of there not being some person who has the exclusive right to determine whether you get exclusion or not like everything has to be chopped up in that way um like I, I think there are some reasons why we might be concerned about turning that over to a process that's driven by financial um purchases uh that someone wants to make and but the thing I want to emphasize is that those objections almost all apply equally well, or at least almost equally well to private property itself. So like people will say, well, you're going to like mess up the whole community. Like the communities come to rely on this person being there. Well, it's that person can just sell anytime they want to. Right. So really, I think most of the objections that are persuasive apply to private property as well, but that doesn't mean they aren't a problem here too, or might not get worse in this system. So I've come to think like, there are two different regimes that I've kind of designed that both are anti-speculative approaches to property. One is the Harburger tax, and the other is soulbound tokens, which are basically an asset that you can't transfer, or at least can't transfer without the permission of some community that you're a part of. Now, soulbound tokens can't be transferred at all. Harburger taxes are like ultra transferable. They like overcome the monopoly problem that stops transfer. Right. And so you might think that there's somewhere in between where the community has a right to veto transfer, but the individual doesn't have too much of a right to veto transfer. Or, or you see what I mean? So, like, then you might actually get to the same level of transfers with more of the ability to stop a transfer being held in some kind of collective way. Um, and I would submit that that may actually be better than either soulbound model or the Harburger model or the private property systems that it seeks to replace. I don't think we've completely mapped out that territory yet, but I think it's a really exciting area to explore. Really helpful answer. Thank you. Um, I, I think that may be a nice transition into decentralized society and soulbound tokens. Um, so yeah. uh, can, can you, uh, yeah, uh, go ahead, Alaka. Yeah, um, can you tell us a bit about your framework for decentralized societies? Um, how do you approach uh, that from like a philosophical and implementation standpoint? And tell us a bit more about what soulbound tokens are and why they're a fundamental um, part of how decentralized societies might work. Yeah, so soulbound tokens are at a first brush, non-transferable tokens. But again, as I caveated before, I actually think a better way to think about it is tokens that can only be transferred with some sort of community permission and not unilaterally by an individual independently. Um, and soulbound tokens uh, allow for, um, okay, so if you think about NFTs, NFTs are perfectly transferable. They can be bought and sold by anybody, but most of the value that we're actually trading with transferable assets in the economy is not transferable. So if you think about like shares of Microsoft, what is Microsoft? Well, it has some physical assets, but the main thing that Microsoft is, is the people who work there and the relationships they have to each other. Those can't just be bought and sold, right? Like, of course, there's a financial element to that relationship, but it is not a relationship that itself is just dissolvable and recombinable in arbitrary ways. So, um, a soulbound token is a way of denoting a relationship or valuable connection and commitment that is not financialized. It cannot be unilaterally transferred by the person who holds it. So like just to give a very close to financial illustration of this, um, rental contracts are not transferable. Like you can't, Almost all rental contracts have limitations on sublease. And as soon as you have a limitation on sublease, it's no longer the case that that's a transferable asset that can just be sold on to anyone, right? And so like rental contract is something very, 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 very basic that like has existed 
essentially for the entire history of property law. And yet it's not representable by an NFT because NFTs are perfectly transferable. Um, in fact, in a world where everything is perfectly transferable, the notion of a person and the notion of a community both do not exist. All that there is is these abstract wrappers that hold abstract value units. There's no actual network of relationships that is in any way like situated. And so soulbound tokens, I claim, is like are critical if you want to have the possibility of having sort of some kind of human set of relationships that constitute a society on top of which you might then think about building financial value. Sorry, I, I, I'm trying not to go on too long, but I can go into more depth on any of these things with further. Um, can you, um, uh, yeah, can you actually go into some depth? Uh, you know, maybe talk about um, uh, the um, sort of use of soul bound tokens to formulate a, you know, like a decentralized society, um, like how that might look. Um. Well, okay, there's a question of what does a decentralized society mean? Let me try to like give a vision of that. So there's um, two of my favorite thinkers of all time are Georg Zimmel and John Dewey. Zimmel has had this idea that we should think of individuals not as sort of separated atoms, but as the intersection of the social communities that they're part of. So what do I mean by that? Um, if you think about, you know, more simple societies, more isolated tribal society, whatever you want to call it, um, you would eat with the same people that you worship with, that you hunt with, that you and gather with, that you uh, marry with, et cetera. Like all of the different definitions of your social circles will heavily overlap with each other. On the other hand, in a more complex urban society, those will start to become independent of one each other. So you will have different work relationships, different social relationships, et cetera. You will be left as the unique intersection of your social relationships. So whereas in the past, you might have a very large intersecting set of all those relationships, that might be a very large chunk of all um, your relationships. I mean, like, in other words, a very large chunk of all, all of the people that you know in one context, you also know in another context, pretty soon you're the only person who you know in all those contexts, right? And so he claims that we should think of individuals in a modern society as having an intersectional identity defined by the intersection of the different social groups that they're a part of. Okay, so that's idea number one. Idea number two is what John Dewey called the concept of an emergent public. This is quite related, and we can come back to this, to Balaji Srinivasan's idea of a network state, but you'll see it's both much, much, much older, 100 years older than that, and uh, much smarter uh, than Balaji's idea in my, my view. So Dewey's idea is that um, the um, as technology evolves, as the way that we live evolves, the um, the uh, ways in which we affect each other uh, change because technology enables us to impact each other in different ways. So, um, you know, it turns out that we, we, it took a while to figure this out, I guess, that um, when we started burning stuff to like, you know, uh, produce things, we messed up the environment. So we were having these global effects on each other uh, that we weren't aware that we were having, right? And, um, you know, when the radio comes in, when uh, railroads come in, we become entangled in our lives with people who are very distant from us in ways that we were not in the past. 
And the problem is that the, the you know, just probability that that lines up with the borders of a historically defined nation state is not very high. And so um, in order to uh, address that problem, in order to um, govern ourselves, we need to constantly be forming new social communities that are like governments, new what he called emergent publics. Like we need to not just rely on nation states, we need to constantly, and in response to all the social change, create new patterns of governance. Okay, so let's take these two concepts. Individuals are the intersections of their social communities, and there are constantly newly emerging and technologically determined collections of people who need to form self-governing institutions. So I claim that these two ideas together constitute a notion that I'll call a decentralized or a network society. It's the notion that, um, to put it very simply, institutions rise and fall, individuals live and die, but the network abides. Um, that, that this fabric that connects things is what constitutes the individual and what constitutes this constantly shifting and emerging set of groups. Um, and I claim that it was this notion that um, JCR Licklider, the um, dark ARPA program officer who founded the ARPANET that became the internet, was trying to build a proof of concept of, a proof of concept of how technology could instantiate uh, that social structure. Um, and that the TCP IP protocol was just a first illustration of how you could do something like that for one very, very, very special problem of, you know, sending unsigned packets out into a void, you know. Uh, and it worked pretty well, you know. I mean, there was challenges, but it worked pretty well. Um, but as Licklider noticed in the late 70s, TCP IP was only going to do 1% of what was necessary to actually create a network society or a decentralized society. It was just, it was just a first illustration of that. You know, in the same way that like that, uh, what, uh, what was the um, bot? I guess maybe it was called Sybil, the, the psychologist, right? Um, uh, I guess that's where the civil problem comes from, was the first illustration of the concept of artificial intelligence. Eliza, Eliza, that's it, yeah. Um, it, first illustration of the idea of uh, artificial intelligence. And so I, I think we should, the way we should think about it is that the internet is, or you know, the thing that the internet is a special case of is just, we're just starting to imagine that, you know? So that, that's, that's the basic idea of a decentralized society. Um, if the um, uh, people naturally move through different social groups over time, um, is that a problem for uh, for SPTs? Like, it, like um, you know, like it feels like you know both both just my my own uh, you know my own personal interests change, and then also the the availability of technology to connect different groups, right? Right, like also changes over time. Maybe maybe the the soul and soul bound token is like a little bit too um, uh, too much of a um, uh, it's perhaps mis misleading I guess but is it a problem that that the social intersections are kind of fluid over time? <coughs> well, I mean, there's a question of whether it fits with putting something onto a blockchain, and then there's a question of whether it's a problem for the theory. So I think for the theory, it's not a problem. I think it's the whole benefit. It's the whole point is to have a network as this um, emergent uh, dynamic representation of the state of people's identities and uh, connections. But um, is an immutable chain a good representation of that? I would say probably to a large extent, not really, um, but I'm not sure it's like totally disastrous either as a first uh, step towards getting there because, um, you know, things are time stamped. And I don't think that there always has to be an interpretation of that data that um, that represents 
the permanent representation of this person's, you know, identity. Um, Nancy, did you have a question? Yes, yeah, sorry, I pressed the send uh, button too quickly. But I was just wondering, with decentralized like structures of governance, would it, would we be able to like realize the maximum benefits if the whole world operated decentralized, or is it like more of like these decentralized structures can coexist with the current status quo? Or is it more of like, uh, it's either one or the other kind of thing? Or is it just like existing? So, so I, I don't, I think that any system that like needs the whole world on it in order to work is like both not a good system um, because it's totalizing uh, and is not a decentralized system because if something's a decentralized system, it's deliberately trying to recognize and account for um, diversity. Now that doesn't mean there can't be major gains to scale, but if if it requires that in order to succeed, it's probably not a decentralized system, right? In in a meaningful sense. So um, yes, I do think there's like many more benefits that one can gain once these systems get to scale. But I think you know the great benefit of a pluralist you know uh, philosophy is that it recognizes there are many different forms of social organization at many different resolutions. And therefore there's almost an infinity of different places to test ideas, right? You can test ideas at any of those social scales and still learn something important about their value. Um, are, are there any other questions about um... Soulbound tokens or decentralized society? Yeah, I've, I've I've got a question. Like like the thing that always kind of strikes me um, about these types of systems is um, I feel like um, the nuance and sophistication we have to apply to kind of understand the systems almost becomes a barrier to their adoption in and of themselves. And so I'm just super curious on. Like, like, as you guys think about like these types of you know potential governance systems kind of coming out in the future, like, how, how, is is there any attention kind of paid to um, uh, uh, the the advantages or disadvantages of how complex these systems can become um, as they're implemented? Well, I think um, one really important thing to realize is that technology. Um, can play a powerful role in helping us to make sense of complexity. Um, quadratic voting could have been implemented, you know, I guess we knew about the quadratic equation, you know, I, I, someone will know the history of math better than me, but probably in, the, in you know, a couple centuries BC or something like that. But I, I think for all practical purposes, it wouldn't really have worked. And the reason is that like having a little slider uh, that shows you like that relationship is really useful, you know? Uh, now that's a very, very simple example, but I, I am a big believer that like virtual reality, artificial, you know, like um, things that appeal to more of our senses can help give us a sense for complexity and so, and, and how different relationships are working that we weren't capable of having otherwise. And in fact, I view that as like one of the great promises of technology is to give us new sensory perception um, that, you know, uh, our, um, you know, the way that our sensory organs work is they take in a bunch of quite chaotic information and they format it into something that we can make sense of. Um, and, you know, neural nets and statistical learning tools can, can do that potentially, uh, and then can feed it back to us. And we may be able to perceive social complexity in a way that we haven't been able to perceive it in the past. Um, Mix, you had a question that you wanted to follow up with. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's, um, similar sort of like extending on this, like how, do, how are these things adopted? Like I'm interested, so I find the theory 
interesting to an extent, but without it being lived, it's useless in my opinion. Um, so it's really, really heartening and awesome to hear, uh, was it John, Jonathan giving a you know, concrete example about building real world community and, and sharing learnings. So yeah, one of the, so I guess the cautionary tale was, um, I worked on this project called Lumio, which was, uh, did sort of online decision-making supports communities to make decisions. And one of the ma major learnings from that is you can polish the technology as much as you want. Um, but what we saw is like when you introduced it to a community, it would immediately raise all of these questions like, oh, uh, how do we make decisions? Like we've got this tool that helps us record our decisions and surface decisions, but like, what is the nature of decisions that we're making? Who is involved in them? Should everyone be involved in every decision? How long do these decisions last for? Like, um, and I think about that as like the zero to one sort of problem <clears throat> where the technology can take you to from one to two, but the zero to one is the culture of like, who who are we and how do we deal how do we deal with disagreement? Like we haven't really covered that yet. Um, and so I guess my question to the group is like, d does anyone have any examples of, any further examples of like messing around with these ideas and, and how are you transitioning people into these sort of new ways of um, relating to one another and making decisions? Yeah. So, broad open question not necessarily just to uh glenn yeah I, one I, thing I, I will say about it which is that <laughs> to me the goal of quadratic voting is not quadratic voting the goal of quadratic voting is to give something concrete to people that's like scientifically grounded and feels like technological progress that empowers them to relate to each other as epistemic peers, you know, and empowers them to realize that they did, don't really know how to do that at scale. And that that's like a problem and that they can struggle on that problem and improve over time. And um, I think, oh, sorry, Mix, yes, uh, go ahead. Yeah, why don't other people jump in? Um, uh, so, so I serve on a number of uh, private company boards, um, uh, and so uh, uh, you, you know, at, at the time that we set up the governance for private companies, um, it, it's all on us in terms of how we want to set up voting structures, what do we want to set vote thresholds at, and how, how, how do we want to do it. Um, uh, and, 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 and look, like the voting structures are allocated to a very select group of people, it's the folks who um, own shares. Um, and so, man, like, like, like I've been listening to today's conversation um, uh, uh, and, and, uh, about, about coming up with novel voting structures, trying to think about how we could apply those in, in those contexts. And uh, in a world in which we have almost infinite latitude to kind of set up these structures, um, we have a tendency um, uh, to just fall back on very, very simple ones. Um, uh, uh, because again, to, to the point that Mix, I think, was making, um, uh, uh, we, for, for, for whatever reason, um, uh, we, we tend to fall back on um, very, very simplified structures. And so I'm, I'm just trying to think in my head, uh, uh, to, to, to borrow Mix's phrasing, like how do we get folks from zero to one to come up with more equitable structures to kind of use uh, w while still getting all their buy-in? Um, uh, man, it's a struggle. Like, 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 like to, to, to give you context in terms of struggle, uh, changing vote thresholds from 51% to 60% on a simple voting structure is like a struggle. Um, uh, uh, and so, and so uh, th this is the thing that's just constantly kind of going through my mind, uh, uh, albeit in a world in which the higher thresholds are probably better ideas and create a lot more uh, distribution of power in, in a very, very efficacious way. Um, uh, and so, and so in, in some ways, like I'm kind of trying to hear um, ways to kind of simplify how we can get folks from zero to one because, because I actually want to get there in a lot of cases. Uh, Colty, did you, did you have a question? Uh, less of a question, more so weaving into like 
this zero to one. Um, and Glenn kept using the word sense, which was really activating for me because that's one of the leaps, I think, when it really comes down to like, how do you have a sense of trust, like in a time bound sort of way? Like, how do you have a sense of trust in an ongoing way? How you feel today might be very different than how you feel next Friday. Do you trust that either of those feelings or how you gener like genuinely would represent yourself in any given conversation? Um, and that's just in a unilateral sort of way. That's a, do I trust myself to represent myself? When it comes to actually like organizing with other components of a network or of a relationship, I think that's a lot more volatile than we can actually calculate for most of the time. Um, and that's one of the big puzzles I see, um, particularly since any number of, uh, like um, Anna made a comment in the chat about like, is it possible that the current democracy crisis is the direct result of advances in science of decision-making? Um, given how many of us make embodied decisions, like, yes, my body is in complete agreement with my representational position. I do think some of the functions that are put upon us um, are inherently coercive because we can't necessarily account for all of the emergent properties of a body and its capacity to express itself in decision making. I don't have an answer to that, but I do look at that puzzle all of the time. Like how can my how can my full sense come to a sense of trust in something that requires other people? Like how do I have a sense of safety in a decision making process is a huge zero to one question for me, particularly when people are being asked to trust institutions or systems that have not thus far been protective of very core aspects of how their diversity comes into uh, plurality. Um, I'm very caffeinated and I appreciate you all listening to that. <laughs> so I spend a lot of time talking with other DAO operators and leaders about this question and we you know, have to, approach it from a, a pretty practical perspective um, because we're actually trying to like, you know, do day-to-day -day things with, with organizations. And I think the most consistent thing I've I've learned from that is that you don't want to over-engineer or over-design governance structures too early when you're in that zero to one phase. Um, you know, the, the best thing you can do is actually just focus on on building you know trust through like softer forms of relationship and consensus um and not try to like everybody wants to start out by writing a constitution and everyone forgets that like there was an article of confederation before the constitution um and it didn't work that well and you know even you know and even the constitution's been amended a bunch of times and so it's like um you know you, you if you try to like I'm a huge governance nerd. I love nothing more than than talking about governance. But if you spend too much time too early trying to talk about governance, um, you're going to get yourself in these sort of traps where you have like a, a 51%, you know, that can't be changed to a 60% because you can't get the quorum on the vote or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so so you, it's better to just start out with the soft systems. Uh, so I have a quick question. Um, so Glenn, I'm curious in the you know, from the perspective of, you know, the concrete and getting people started, are you seeing any applications of these soul bound tokens, you know, today that stand out and really excite you and are enabling some kind of coordination or behavior that, you know, wasn't previously possible? Um, I think the ones I'm most familiar with are Optimism and Gitcoin, um, which are using these uh, as ways of creating different types of governance structures. In the case of Gitcoin, it's dealing with a more sophisticated version of the civil problem, kind of like I was saying, they're, they're giving people soulbound tokens that represent sort of different parts of who they are. Um, in the case of optimism, it's, um, they, they have something called a citizen house and a, uh, gosh, what's the other token house? It, they basically have like a bicameral process of governance that um, uses soulbound tokens in one, case and a more 
financialized in the other case. And then there's a bicameral, you know, usual like checks and balances relationship between them. So uh, can I ask a, just a quick follow-up, which is that how then is like the soul bound token actually working within those communities? And, and what does that, what does that actually look like? In the case of optimism, it's uh, entitlement to participate in the governance process as an individual. Oh, um, okay. You have to have sort of been a developer, you know, working and contributing for long enough to get one. In the case of Gitcoin, it's sort of characterizing your social relationships so that they can take those into account in the way that funds are awarded so that people like all from the same company, for example, aren't the only ones funding some grant and then like plundering the tr treasury based on that. Cool. Um, so in, in, in your DSOC paper, um, you, you, you and your collaborators like did sort of touch on uh, perhaps the darker side of DSOC and soulbound tokens, which is that it, you know, you make these uh, social connections legible that it can be taken advantage of by, um, you know, like authoritarian state actors. Like, what are your thoughts on this? Like, what is, um, uh, like, how do we fix this? Um, I, I think, uh, ultimately these should not mostly be on public ledgers. They should mostly be on ledgers that are relevant to particular communities, um, and that can't be shared outside those contexts. And I think you can build them, you can build towards that from a more public ledger setting. And we talk a little bit about that in the paper, but ultimately I think that um, ledgers are important and shared ledgers are important, distributed ledgers are important, but uh, not globally financially gated ledgers, ones that are gated by more social uh, relationships. And anyways, we can go a lot into the privacy stuff. I mean, that's something I've been thinking about a lot. I've been talking to you about that, Wes, as well. I don't just don't want to dive too deep. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, um, uh, I'm sure there are clever privacy preserving techniques to, <laughs> or to implement some of these things. But I, but it just, I, I don't even, I, you know, there are clever privacy, but, but I don't even want the clever ones. Like, I want the like really interesting, socially grounded ones that are mm. not just about like this not being seen but being checked, but like that are actually um, about a piece of information living within a social community context. And not just within a um, individual's, uh, you know, private information set. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Um, how, how do we do that? I mean, do do we all need to like spin up our own hardware for our local communities, running our own chains, or like what? Are there better solutions for that? Are there like community zk proof structures? Or there's a lot to be said about this. Uh, <laughs> um, Trey Jane, who's a collaborator of mine, is going to be putting out a bunch of papers about this kind of stuff. There's something we've got a prototype coming out of, which is called a um, a uh, like a community designated verifier proof, which allows you to have information that is shared within a community but is non credible if it's uh, shared to someone outside that world. So. Um, so we're um, uh, coming to the end of, of our hour and a half. So I, I wanted to um, maybe close uh, close with a question and uh, and then leave some space for people, um, you know, to uh, to have some comments or final uh, final questions. Um, can you uh, talk a bit about what you see are the um, uh, the principal differences I think between the pluralistic philosophy and uh, and the network state as described by Balaji? Yeah, so um, Balaji Srinivasan has this book called The Network State. Um, the main idea there is that um, highly aligned people will sort of exit from uh, the nation state system and form their own founder led, um, possibly physically distributed uh, jurisdictions that will then be recognized by other governments and treated as a full sovereign. Um, and I think there's many differences between the philosophy I described in that one, but the most important one is that Balaji is focused on the notion of alignment. 
So he wants to get out of a context where people are um, like having to deal with people who are very different from them to a context where people are able to take collective action because they're with other people who are very close in perspective to them. And, uh, you know, the pl pluralist perspective instead sees identity as intersectional. It sees us as not having like one group that defines us, but rather that there is going to be different groups that we're close to on different things. And so no matter who we cluster with, we're going to be disaligned from them along certain dimensions. And so it, it views like the whole point of a network to me is precisely not that you're in the aligned group with the people that you're together with. And it's, it's instead that you're in a range of different groups that are all relevant to different aspects of you. Um, and that uh, there might be many different publics that you're part of. Um, and that these publics all should be in some sense self-governing, democratic, not governed by a founder who defines what it is to be aligned with this group. So anyway, th those are some of the most important divergences. We're, we're going to publish a piece about this. Yeah, one of the ways that I, I think about this is, um, you know, from uh, Albert Hirschman's um, framework of exit voice and loyalty, where he, he um, uh, he points out that in uh, communities in which it is very easy to 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 exit, um, uh, there tend to be less robust um, sorts of mechanisms for expressing your voice, right? And vice versa, in a community in which there is a very good way for you to express your voice, there's less of of a uh, you know of a of a need to be able to exit. And I feel like the I feel like the, uh, a Dabology camp sort of like leans like much more towards exit. Um, than uh, right than the plurality camp, which is like leaning much more towards voice. Um, so you know, like it's an interesting uh, kind of a balance going on there. Um, uh, does anybody have any um, any closing questions or comments? Glenn, that was a really helpful distinction um, with, with the network state. I'm curious, like, what does this look like in 10 years? Like, you know, given, given where we've come in the, in the last five or 10, like wh where do you think tangibly we're, we're going to land in the next decade? I mean, I think a lot of it's collectively up to us. I don't think the future is determined. I think we can shape it, but, um, but I think, you know, what Taiwan has accomplished, if that, if, if the whole world could accomplish what Taiwan has accomplished, I'd be a very happy cap camper. Uh, I don't think that that's complete change to some completely different, you know, way of living, but it is the harnessing of the potential of information technology to build, you know, diverse perspectives and pluralism and reasonable degrees of political, you know, cohesion and bottom up transformation and whatever. And I, I think if, we, if, if, you know, most of the develop of, of the you know, democracies of the world looked like that, I think we'd be in gr a great place. Really quickly on that one, there's an interesting, if you look at the, if you think about that as a sort of zero to one um, thing, um, Taiwan's context is that they're really, they're really recently into democracy. They have like very fresh in their minds what it's like to not have democracy. And they had, so there's like a bunch of cu cultural context which makes that possible. So I want to follow Taiwan and I'm asked and I'm like interested what what are the bits of culture that we need to adopt along with the technology which will make that possible. And I, I also think they have a threat model that's really important, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, I think an important part of getting to his place like that for us would be making people feel a threat model like that you know like making people feel some kind of authoritarian threat or like taking all this like whining about technology and turning it into something where people really feel they have to do something to change it so uh i hope telling the story of taiwan can be a, a part of that to make people feel that there's a possibility and feel like there's something that needs to be addressed so that, that's one one element of it for me. 
So we're basically at time. Um, does anyone have any closing questions or comments either for the group or to Glenn? That was just an incredibly um, eye-opening uh, conversation and really helped uh, organize, I think, a lot of uh, kind of disparate threads that I think we're experiencing in the world today. And I'm just really thankful. This was my first uh, first salon and I am like hooked. <laughs> Thank you. We hope to see you at future ones. Anyone else? If not, um, Glenn, thank you again. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, well, you, we can all follow you on Thanks you guys. Um, what are some other good places to follow you, especially now that Twitter is quite volatile? Yeah, I, I may be leaving Twitter at the, by the end of the day. I was really not happy with what has just been happening. So I'm not going to give you my Twitter handle. But um, follow the Radical Exchange website. Follow the Plurality Institute website, plurality.institute. Uh, so you all put them in. Um, Um, uh, and follow at Microsoft this. Thank you. Uh, and we'll share those links out both through the II uh, listserv and also on Twitter for anyone who's left. But thank you again, Glenn, for joining us. And thank you all for sharing your Friday afternoons or evenings or nights, wherever you are. And Wes and I hope to see you at future salons. Have a have a great rest of your Friday. Bye. Bye. Uh, just thank you. Uh, Alaka, before you drop us, um, yeah. does anyone want to go hang out like in an after party? Like I might go to a bar, not a bar literally, but you know, we could jump to a different Zoom and hang out and just chat if anyone wanted to. I think we can end the recording and then just stick around in the Zoom if you want to keep chatting. Lovely. That sounds nice. All right. I'll stop recording. Thanks, everyone.